we could not pay. But God displayed his mercy, the greatest gift of love. When we could not reach heaven, heaven came to us. He made a way in a manger. smiled in wonder the shepherd stood in awe the sacrifice of heaven lay sleeping in the straw We can celebrate Christmas for that for that very reason. Uh, he didn't come just so we can set up a cute little nativity scene, uh, but I'm thankful that he came to die for sinners uh, such as me. And if you're here this morning, I want you to leave knowing that Christ died for you uh, so that you can have a way, and I'm grateful so very much for that. Take your Bibles and go with me this morning in the book of First Peter, chapter number 2. <clears throat> this is not per se a Christmas message. And so uh, we're not going to be talking about Luke chapter number 2 this morning. And um, we're not going to be talking about the wise men per se. Uh, although if you would heed the message, we would be wise men. But uh, we're not going to be talking about a per se Christmas message. But it is something the Lord placed upon my heart. And uh, something that I believe is very necessary in the day we live. Uh, we need to see it in the lives of people. And I'll, I'm getting kind of ahead of myself before I have you to stand uh, and we read uh, probably the first 10 verses of Luke chapter number 2. I will say this, 
uh, we need to be very cautious in how we live our life to the, to the manner that um, we need to be, be careful that we're not right, but we're not living right. And what I mean is this, a lot of times we talk and we say the right things, uh, we do the right things, and we don't do the things that we shouldn't do. When we, we're, we're all in this, um, this general toy soldier type of thinking, if you would. Um, but when it comes to living it on the outside uh, and it being real life and real life principles, I think if we're not careful, we can overlook those things and say, well, we're right and that's what matters. Uh, but we, we need to put into practice that which God has put in our hearts. So uh, stand with me, if you would, this morning. We'll read again the first 10 verses, and I'm going to read down through these kind of quickly, and you read along, you follow along with me as I read, and, uh, and then we'll, I'll share with you what I believe the Lord's placed on our heart. The Bible said this, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be dis disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Mercy. Let's bow together for prayer. Brother John, take us one prayer if you would. Amen. Thank you for standing this morning. You can be seated. Chapter 1 ends with a reminder of the provision of salvation. Uh, and I know of uh, no better topic than we can talk about at any season of the year than that of salvation that's provided by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verses 18 through 25, it deals with the redemption. Uh, or as in verse number 23, it tells us the result of redemption being being born again. Uh, those are biblical terminologies, by the way. When we talk about being saved or we talk about um, the things that we so commonly use, uh, it's important to use biblical terminology. And being born again is biblical terminology. And it's representative of those who have been given new life in Jesus Christ. Those who have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and attained by faith. Uh, but in context of, of the end of chapter number 1, you can skip over to, to chapter number 2 and look down at verse number 9 because we can see two distinct categories of people. In chapter 2, verse number 9, the Bible says, um, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal a priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises. That's the wrong verse. Back into verse number 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. So two classes of people found in verse number 7. Number 1, you find those who believe. Okay? Those who believe, those who have responded to the message uh, that chapter number 1 and those following verses talk about being born again or redeemed, if you will, by the precious blood of Christ. And so the first category would be uh, those who believe, those who are believers. The second category would be those who are disobedient or disobedient to the message as we just read in the context of chapter number 2. And so there's really only two groups that you're either in to th this morning. Uh, you're either part of the crowd that's believers or you're part of the crowd that's disobedient. You see, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the key to that is, is are, have you been obedient to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? That good news uh, of great joy that we talked about during the Christmas season, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior. A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so we see here that there's two distinct classes of people. Those who believe or who count Christ as being precious. And if you've been born again by the grace of God, isn't He precious today? Everything that we have, we have because of Him. Everything that we enjoy, everything that we hope for is not because of our good deeds, works, or actions. It's because of the finished work of Calvary. Uh, you've heard this before. Imagine if you would, you've got, uh, you've got um, maybe you have siblings or, or maybe you have rather children and uh, they're going off to camp for the first time. 
I mean, they've never, they've never left home. Uh, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just young, and, and so they're going off to camp. And before you put them on that, that van, with, with you, before Andrew and Rachel, or even before that, before Brother Jason and Miss Haley, uh, put them in a van to, tear, to carry them off somewhere. And mom and dad, you're kind of wringing your hands. And you're like, oh, I hope my baby's okay, and, and we'll be praying for them. And everything. But you look at them and say, hey, listen, act like you're somebody. Don't, don't, be acting, don't be acting crazy. Don't be acting a fool. Act like you're somebody. Remember who you represent. Now, you've heard me use that illustration before. Uh, probably most of you have heard that speech or given that speech or both uh, in the years that you've either been a child or had children. Act like you are somebody. In other words, there is a personal responsibility to behave yourself in a manner that you're a representative of someone else. In other words, that you know better. All right, that you're to be an example as you, as you go back, act like somebody. Well, verse number 9 of chapter number 2, and this is where I, I wrote down the wrong verse. Verse number 9 of chapter number 2 tells us that those who are believers, now not the, not the disobedient, right, two crowds, but the believers have been made somebodies. He says that you're a chosen generation. I'm not going to go through these and define all of these. You can go home and do a little bit of study and look it up. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Uh, verse 10 sums it up this way. I like verse 10. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. What that means basically is this. As believers at one time started out as nobodies. But because of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, He has made us to be somebodies or specifically to be the people of God. We were outsiders, outcasts if you would, particularly those of us who are Gentiles. Uh, we were outcasts without hope, uh, with, with, without Christ and having no hope in this world as I believe it's the book of 1 Corinthians teaches us. And yet upon salvation, there's a miraculous work of God that takes place in our hearts. We are birthed, we are adopted, if you would, into the family of God. And because of our, uh, of our relationship with Jesus Christ, He has made us to be this chosen generation, this royal priesthood, this holy nation, this peculiar people. I want to talk about this morning the purposes that God made believers these things. There's a reason why. It's not so that we can become religiously pious or we can look down our super spiritual noses at those who may be without. As a matter of fact, it's anything contrary to that. It's not so that we can become religious Pharisees. And I'm going to tell you there's a lot of Phariseeism goes on even among people who are right doctrinally. A lot of Phariseeism. In other words, we'll get to where we think more highly of ourselves than what we really are. And if we're not careful, we can allow that mentality, we can allow the privileges that we have in Jesus Christ to display itself in a manner of which we have become better or seemingly better than those who have not been recipients of the grace of God as of yet. That is not the purpose that God has made us this way. It was not so we can just feel special about ourselves. I mean, we like to feel special. And uh, some of us truly are special. But we like to feel pretty good about ourselves. We like to feel, uh, you know, that there's something unique about us. But with, apart from Jesus Christ, we're nothing. Right. We have nothing. All right, and so uh, we, we look at this uh, as, as what's the purpose. The Bible reads this way, that ye, he's made us these things in verse number 9, for a purpose that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I want to focus <clears throat> on those two words this morning, show forth. To show forth or to put on display, to manifest, if you would. Uh, David said upon bringing in the ark to uh, the people of Israel, uh, upon getting it back, David said this in 1 Chronicles 16, Sing unto the Lord, O all, all the earth. Show forth from day to day His salvation. Now that's a pretty good statement uh, that those of us who are believers can set as a pattern for our life that each and every single day we can show forth the praises of of him and show forth the praises of his salvation. You know what this world needs to see? They need, they, they need to see two things. Number one, they need to see that there is hope and that hope is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. But they also need to see that he does make a genuine, uh, true difference in the life of believers who have placed their faith and trust in him. Brother Chuck was talking about this morning about the difference that it makes. I'm going to tell you, Jesus makes a difference in the lives of those who place their faith in him. Amen. Now, it doesn't mean we become perfect people. It doesn't mean that we do everything right. It does not mean that on a practical standpoint that we have no failures. But what it means is, is that Jesus Christ had made such an impact in our life that it changes the very essence of our character. 
It changes who we are and what we do and how we put things into practice. Uh, Listen, I for one am grateful for the salvation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Listen, I still have struggles, but I'm I'm grateful this morning that I struggle with struggles. In other words, I don't want to have the struggles. He's changed my desire. He's changed my heart, if you would. And I'm grateful for that. But the world needs to see that there is a real, genuine change in believers in Christ Jesus. They need to see that it's more than shallow religion. They need to see that it's more than just uh, something that we talk about, that we preach about, but we don't practice. There's a difference. Man, we're good at preaching, but practicing changes everything. We're good at proclaiming what we know to be right, but it's ch- it challenges us to actually practice those things. The psalmist go on to say this, singing to the Lord, bless His name, show forth His salvation from day to day. Psalm 9-1, I will praise Thee, O Lord, with my whole heart I will show forth all Thy marvelous works. And so today, I just want to take just a few simple thoughts out of this passage in 1 Peter, And I want to encourage believers to act like you're somebody. Act like you are somebody. In other words, put on display that you are who you profess to be. Now that right there is where we get down to where Christianity becomes practical. We profess that we're strangers and pilgrims upon this earth. We profess that Jesus Christ made such an impact that He delivered our soul from a devil's hell. We profess all of these things, but there comes to to a point to where we must have practical Christianity. I needed to carry me past church service and carry it uh, to whenever I go to the workplace. I needed to carry me to where I'm at family functions. I need my Christianity to be on display regardless of where I may be. I needed to be real in my life. I needed to be real. And so for that to happen, we're going to have to act like we're somebody. Now, two or three things that's involved in this. Number one, there is a biblical principle of growth that we can find in this portion of Scripture. A biblical principle of growth. The idea here is that believers are to mature and actually we're to grow up in Christ Jesus. Look at the latter part of verse number 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Why? That ye may grow thereby. You know, it's a sad day when believers stop growing. It's a sad time when believers get to the place that they're uh, satisfied, if you would, in their spiritual maturity. Because according to what I, what I can read and what I can tell, we should never stop growing. We should never stop maturing. If I was to ask you to, to ask yourself an honest question, how many of us, by looking at our life, are not where we used to be? Or not, maybe, maybe we've come backward and we went in the wrong direction from where God, at one time, we, we professed to be in our Christian walk. Can I tell you something? Something has happened that stunted our growth. All right, there, is a, there ought to be a, a movement toward maturity and for growing. Anything, any living organism that's not growing, not maturing, is really not healthy. Now, we understand that life has stages. All life has stages, whether it be plant life, animal life, our life, we have stages. And when we cease to grow, uh, we, you, you know, somebody said, well, uh, I believe it was uh, Brother Denny said he was, he was doing pretty good this morning except his foot, and that happens with birthdays. Well, Brother Denny, it's better than the option. It's better than the option. When you stop having birthdays, you got problems. You say, I'd, I'd like to stay 30 the rest of my life. Not if you know what that takes. 31 looks awful good. Uh, now, what I'm saying is this. A healthy child of God will continue to grow and will continue, will continue to mature and will continue to be more and more like Jesus Christ. So, so some, some things about principles of growth. First of all, I think we need to recognize, then remove some things that will hinder our growth. There are things in life that will hinder growth. There's things, that, if you would, that will stunt your growth. You, you've heard that. You, your parents have said, don't, don't eat that, don't do that. That'll stunt your growth. Don't do that. All right, well, while that just might be for you picking up a bad vice in life, uh, let me tell you, there's some things in our Christian life, if we're not careful, can, can stunt your growth. All right, and he tells us this back in verse number 1, wherefore laying aside some things. All right, that means we've got to acknowledge that there are some things that may at one time been present in our life. That maybe through the course of time we've allowed these things to creep back in and become prevalent in our life once again. And he says to lay them down. It's the indication of this that you're already holding on to it. That you're already carrying it around. Okay, it's not. He didn't say don't pick it up. He said, but he said lay it aside. It's the indication that there's some some things in these possibly immature Christian's life that they're holding on to and it's hindering them for going further in the cause of Christ because of what they're clinging to. And he says as he writes here, lay those things aside so that you can move on and grow. 
Put those things down. Malice, ill will, or desire to injure. Now, all of these things I think we're going to tie in with our testimony, with living the way that he wants us to live or, or acting like we are somebody. Uh, malice is ill will or desire to injure. Man, there's a lot of malice in Christianity. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of things in Christianity that if we're not careful, we can get our eyes and we can mistreat brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a lot of malice. He said, lay those things aside. Guile or deceit. The word deceit and the word guile, uh, it's also used as a word like bait. Some of you fishermen, you understand the concept of bait. You know, bait is, is pretty sneaky. Bait's sneaky. You say, why? Because you're luring them in. You're presenting something and you're doing it with the whole intent of purpose of, 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 of hooking them. Right? Is that why you go? The whole intent of... Now, by the way, I, I'm just going to give you this. Daryl cheats. He got a fish finder at all, but invites him to come to his house and jump in the cooler. <laughs> but, but you throw that, that bait, right, with, with, a, with, a, with, a, <laughs> with a deceptive intent. You're trying to make that fish feel like, man, everything's okay. Take it. Go on. This will help you. This is good. You want it. You like it. Take it. And all of a sudden, they take it, and it harms them, right? That's what the word uh, guile has to deal with. It's that type of deceit, trying to get someone to fall, trying to get someone to trip up. Listen, if we're going to display Christ in our life and act like somebody, we're going to lay these things aside. We're going to lay them aside. Then he talks about hypocrisies. Hypocrisies is assuming a false or counterfeit appearance which conceals the real opinions or purposes. Now think about it for just a minute. Laying aside, you know, we, you say hypocrisy is saying one thing and doing another, but it's really deeper than that. It's presenting ourselves to be that we have this great philosophy, but really our intents and purposes are different. Okay, and so he says, lay aside the hypocrisy, envies. We know what envy is, uh, envy, among, uh, envy among believers, uh, evil speakings. That's defamation, right? you know, backbiting, running people down. He said, listen, you got to lay aside that these things are hindering our growth. But then he gives this, what about hungering for that which causes growth? Hungry. How many of you, if I was to ask you a question, you think you'd be hungry here in about 20 minutes? Some of you say, Preacher, I ain't had no breakfast. I'm hungry now. Yeah. All right. And you begin to have a desire. You begin to have an appetite for something. Can I tell you it's healthy for a child of God to have an appetite for that which will make them grow? Here's the problem. Sometimes our appetite can be twisted. Because when we get away from what Christ wants us to be, we can begin to have an appetite, but have an appetite for the wrong things. Now listen, I'm not here to preach this morning about having that, that type of appetite, but I'm saying this, there ought to be a desire, there ought to be an appetite that we have to hunger for that which will make us stronger, that which will make us closer, that which will make our walk even better. And so he said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, that you may grow thereby. Now, I'll give you this and we'll move. When it talks about the sincere milk of the word, uh, I mean, it's, it's a biblical illustration, but that of a, that of a child or that of a baby, uh, that, that, of, that is something so simple. Now, uh, you know, we had, we had a bunch of people over at the house yesterday, a lot of family, and, and uh, they, brought, they brought the baby up. I got, I got another one on the way, two more on the way. I, I like it. I like them grandbabies, and, and I even like most of my in-laws. Uh, well, anyway, I'm going to leave that alone. And uh, but 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 Elliot was there, and uh, you know we were, we were eating. We had you know we had lasagna and spaghetti, and I mean, we were we were eating. We were eating well. I had dessert, but he couldn't eat any of those things, brother Daryl. But when they popped that bottle in his mouth, man, he chugged that bottle down. And uh, now that wouldn't probably done anything for us. I can promise you, it wouldn't done nothing for me. But to him, man, he he just. He just engulfed it. And it's, and it's building him to where he can handle that one day that he will sit around the table and eat with his brothers and sisters and, and his aunts and uncles and his mama and papa. It, that, it, it's building him for that. But when it talks about the sincere milk of the word, it's a word that means pure, but it's the simple truths of Christianity. The simple doctrines. Let me tell you this. We're never going to accept the deeper things until we can grasp the simple things. And not only grasp it, not only understand it, but till we put those things in practice. Until we allow that Word of God to per so permeate in our life that it affects how we walk, it affects how we live, it, it affects our conduct, and we'll see that here in just a minute. Uh, but listen, we, we've got to get our mind... Some, sometimes we, we get the cart way before the horse. And we're out there, and I want to do great things and big things, but yet the simple things that we know to do, we don't yet put into practice. 
Can I tell you, listen, there's a principle of growth. Second of all, man, this is so vital. What about the, the need for personal holiness? Personal holiness. We've seen in verse number 9 that believers are called. In verse number 3, we acknowledge that He is gracious unto you. Uh, verse number 3, to whom, uh, if so be, rather, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Uh, when we come down to verse number 10, we're being reminded, listen, that He has shown mercy. All of these things God has done for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. All of these things He's done for believers. He's called them. He's been gracious to them. He showed mercy to them. And in light of those things, we see a responsibility for, pers for personal holiness. Uh, it would go to the motive, if you would, of why we live such a life. It's, it's not rules and guidelines and, and all of these things that we have to. We have to do this and we can't do that and we, we should do this and we shouldn't do that. No, it's a motivating factor for personal holiness. That my relationship with Christ, because of what He's done, because of who He's made me to be, I want to act like that I'm somebody. I want to act like the person. I want to be a representative of the type of individual that Christ has made me and declared me and called me to be. Personal holiness. Now, if we're going to live a holy life, I think there's some things we need to understand. First of all, verse number 11, we're going to have to keep ourselves in check. To keep ourselves in check. If you're anything like me, you're your own worst enemy. I'm my own worst enemy. My flesh, my desires, the lust, the cravings of my heart, I'm my own worst enemy. You know, I can point my finger at everyone else around, but at the end of the day, I'm my own worst enemy. And if I'm going to live a holy life, a personal holy life, can I tell you, no one else can cause you to live an unholy life. I, I can't make Brother Chuck live an unholy life. Now, I can influence him. And I think we ought to be very aware of our influence, whether it be positive or negative. Uh, I'm going to influence the people I'm around. If my life don't match up with my, with my lips, I'm going to influence them the wrong way. But at the end of the day, the decision for personal holiness is just that. It's personal. It's a decision that I'll make. It's a practice that I'll put into action. And so personal holiness is an individual thing. Keep yourself in check. Verse 11, he tells us some things to abstain from. Now, remember we talked about some that we're to lay, lay aside. But now he said there's some things that we ought to stay away from. Don't, don't even pick them up. Don't even allow these things to come into your life. Abstain or to stay away from these things. Uh, he says fleshly lust. That's carnal desires. Those are those things that, that your flesh wants that you really don't want nobody to know that they want. Carnal desires. Uh, listen, worldly, worldly desires. Again, uh, listen, I'm not, I'm not here on, on that aspect to, to name each and every each and every thing or each and every instance, but I'm going to tell you this, there are some things that our flesh desires that are displeasing to our Savior. There are some things that are clearly outlined in Scripture, uh, some things that are pleasing to God that we're involved in, and there's some things that are displeasing to God if we become involved in those fleshly carnal desires. You do understand the concept that your flesh did not get saved. Listen, I still live with my flesh. I still battle my flesh. Paul, in his, uh, and what a great Christian he was, he said, listen, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Uh, he talks about literally uh, about buffeting the flesh. Why? Because he still had those fleshly carnal desires. And when we talk about personal holiness, we're going to have to keep ourselves in check. And that, that includes not only what we do on the outside, but what we think and dwell on when it comes to that on the inside. You may, not, you may not struggle. I, I, I believe you do because you're made of the same stuff I am. But, you know, we're really good about putting on a facade on the outside. We're, we're really good about getting everybody else to believe, man, they're, they're, if there's anybody spiritual, it's them. And, man, they love the Lord, and that's good. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes I think we're, we can be corrupt on the outside. This, is, this might be a cheesy illustration, but anybody like bananas? You like bananas? I bought two bunches of bananas, maybe possibly just for this illustration. And I'm going to give you this illustration so I don't buy no more bananas like this. All right. Now, Dad likes bananas that are past their prime. They're, just, just to say it in, in a nice fashion, they're past their prime. In other words, they're, they're, they're bruised and beat up and they got some... They're not yellow. Bananas ought to be yellow. Um... And then some people like them way to the other. They like the green ones, right? And uh, the only thing the green ones are good is so you can leave them on the counter until they ripen and ready to eat. But some of us like good bananas. Yellow. 
bananas. Well, I, we bought some bananas the other day. We were at, I think we were at Sam's or something, and we bought some bananas, and it's happened to me twice. And so bottom line is, is I'm not promoting Sam's bananas. And, uh, but we bought some, and on the outside, man, they were just the prettiest yellow, Brother Terry, that you've ever seen. I mean, they look good. We picked them out. You know, we're kind of picky, uh, kind of look around. And nobody can ever, by the way, this is free, nobody can ever buy the first bunch of bananas that you pick up. Think about it. You pick up some that look yellow, what do you do? You make your way around that little circle. It's got all the bananas. At the end of the day, you know what you got? Bananas. All right, and so we picked some out, and we got home, and man, they look so good. And these are what a banana ought to look like. And I plucked the banana off, and I began to peel the banana, and I thought, that don't look like it ought to look. And when I broke it open, Brother Chuck, it was good on the outside, but on the inside, it was rotten on the inside. I didn't know bananas could do that. It was rotten on the inside, wasn't it? It was rotten on the inside. And I thought, okay, well, that's just one. So I got the other one. The whole bunch was rotten. I bought another bunch from Sam's the other day. Same thing. Same thing. Now, on, to me, they owe, my, they owe me my money back. All right. You know why? Because they appeared to be something on the outside that they weren't on the inside. Good. And I think if we're not careful, we can, have the same, we can have the same effect and the same outcome. And I believe it will have the same outcome because, and it will come out. When the people that you've been parading that you are something on the outside really see the heart of who you are on the inside, I believe it'll do the same thing to you as those bananas did to me. It'll make them where I have no appetite for them whatsoever. It'll make me to where I didn't want anything to do with that banana, any bananas, or a matter of fact, any bananas on the shelf for a while because I didn't want another rotten banana. You say, well, preacher, that's cheesy and that's corny. Maybe, but I'm telling you, there's a need for personal holiness and keeping ourselves in check. Let me give you this one. What about to conduct yourself appropriately? Uh, we, we've heard this. Uh, sometimes people get fired for conduct unbecoming. All right? They shouldn't have behaved that way. They shouldn't have acted that way. Conduct yourself appropriately. I, I'm, I'm taken back sometimes again that the people, and, and, if, and if I'm honest, I, I, I've been one of them. I'm not proud of it, but I've been one of them. That the people who are so adamant about being right but yet we don't live in such a way that, that we're righteous. Our doctrine's right. Our teaching's right. But our, our practice and our practicality in our Christian living is just rotten. It's just rotten. Uh, we would rather live more like Pharisees than we would reaching someone with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on. Uh, listen, I, I don't agree with everything that everybody does. There's some churches that I don't line up with. Now, they preach the gospel, and, uh, but they might do things a little bit differently than I do. But you know what? At the end of the day, that's their church. That's their decision. And if I develop a rotten and a, and a pharisaical attitude toward that, let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to lose my impact for the cause of Christ. I, I, I've, I've given this illustration before, but I told you about the time that we were on visitation. We were knocking doors and we were giving the gospel. And there's a, there's a local um, worship center, however they want to call it. They would call it, a, 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 they don't have church in their name. Um, they get a lot of they get a lot of flack, and, and again, I don't line up. There's some doctrinal things that I can't line up with. Uh, but when we were there, there was a genuine zeal and excitement for Jesus Christ with the individual we talked to. There was a genuine love for believers, and I'm telling you, if we're not careful, we'll lose that because we're so uh, caught up in trying to be right that we forget to put it down in practical living. Yes, sir. We got to keep ourselves in check, but our conduct ought to be appropriate. You know what this gets into? Testimony. Conduct can either build or destroy your testimony. How we act and how we behave. Testimony, first of all, is to be honest. The word honest means beautiful by reason of purity of heart or life. Praiseworthy, morally good, and noble. We'll see that word here again uh, in just a moment. Uh, he says before the Gentiles. Two groups of people that this could have influenced. Number one, Gentiles were oftentimes referred to as unsaved people. They were people who were without, especially when talking to the Jews, uh, which when you read the book of 1 Peter, he's dealing with those in exile or those who are, who are scattered. But it can also describe a group of people who are new to the faith because, you know, they didn't have the, they didn't have the Old Testament. They didn't have the, the prophecies. They didn't have the scriptures. And so all of it's brand new to them. And so a, a rotten attitude could be detrimental to their growth and to their lack of growth. And he said that we ought, they ought to conduct themselves accordingly 
before these Gentile people. A testimony uh, is seen by our good works, not so much by our talk. Look what he says in verse number 12. Having your conversation or our conduct, if you would, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evil, or they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Good is the same word here as honest. Uh, and so we see that they ought to be pure or they ought to be, uh, if you would, um, uh, they ought to be honest deeds, pure in motive and of, of life. All right, so our works ought to, ought to display what we work out, ought to display, if you would, what Christ has worked in. Then our testimony, listen to this, should glorify God. My life and your life as a believer, if you profess to know Jesus Christ, my life and my works and my conduct ought to bring glory to my Savior. It ought to bring glory to my Savior. Now this is where we really have to stop and keep ourselves in check for personal holiness. And ask ourselves an honest question, does my life glorify my Savior? Does, does my conduct, does my actions glorify my Father who has saved me and called me by His grace? 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, by, grace, I, by the grace of God I am what I am. Can I tell you something today? Before we think too highly of ourselves, understand this. It's only by the grace of God that we are who we are. It's only by, by the grace of God that we can be in the crowd of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. It's only and solely by the grace of God. Listen, to, down to verse number 16, I won't, get, I won't get into this, but it deals with the liberty without maliciousness. We have liberty to live our life, but not for evil purposes. Not, not, for, the, not for the good of, of, of our flesh and the fulfilling of our flesh. So we have liberty. Let me give you one more. What about our practical calling? This, this is, gets down. This is, this is the, uh, if you would, this is, will help tie in the what, all these other things we talked about, with the how. How do we practically act like somebody? Think about that, that kid on the bus. Maybe, maybe you were in their shoes one time. Maybe, maybe you've got on that bus or you've got on that church van or you've got on the school bus and your mom and dad have just told you, hey, listen, you better act like somebody. Don't, don't let me hear uh, of a bad. And maybe you sat on that school bus and say, man, what in the world are they talking about? I, I, I've acted like this my whole life. How, how are they talking about it? I don't, I don't know what they mean. But okay, I'm going to say it so I don't get in trouble. All right, how do we actually do what we're, at, what we're required to do? Well, I think there's two things. Number one, I think we're going to have to consider the example of Christ as a servant. Verse 21 down through verse number 23 teaches us a very simple concept. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. All right, so what he's saying is this in verse number 20. Uh, there's, there's times that we're going, to be, we're going to be buffeted for that which we don't deserve. We're going to go through some difficult times as Christians uh, and we, we must handle ourselves in a Christ-like fashion. We must keep our conduct in check. How do we do it? It's impossible to do. No, Jesus did it. The one who saved us and called us. And by the way, the one who sent his spirit to empower us. He did it. And therefore, we can look to him as an example of our servanthood. Uh, listen, he says in Philippians, what's he say? And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and being, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It right, tells us in the verse prior to that, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. It's hard to die to yourself, isn't it? It's hard to die to those fleshly, uh, fleshly lusts and those uh, evil desires. It's hard to die to that. We want it. You've heard this, the heart wants what it wants. It wants what it wants, yeah, but we're to die to ourselves and allow our conduct to be coming of that Jesus Christ. And so consider the example, but what about this one? Committing ourselves to the equity of the Father. We hear a lot of talk in our society about equity, about equity, keeping everything on the same, keeping things righteous and just. Well, listen to what he says. How did Jesus do it? Who, when he was reviled, verse 23, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But instead of doing those things, committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Can I tell you this, child of God? God judges righteously. He judges righteously. And by, by, by me living for Him, I'm laying aside that which I feel is my right. That which I feel. Listen, I, I'm just, just like laying aside in verse number 1 and abstaining in verse number 11. Those things are an act of will. They're a choice. I have a choice whether or not to lay aside. I have a choice whether or not I'm going to abstain. And I also have a choice whether or not I'm just going to commit my life unto Him and live for Him just like Jesus Christ committed His life under the Father. If I'm to act like somebody, I'm going to have to give everything that I am to Him. 
Lord, I belong to you. You've made me what I am. And therefore, I'm going to give my life back to you. You know, we talk about, we talk about the gifts of Christmas, you know, the, the gifts of the Magi, and, and they're all representative. Uh, but, the, but the greatest thing you'll ever give Christ is just give, give yourself back to Him. The greatest thing you'd ever do. And that we can show forth the praises of Him who hath called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. But I'm going to have to commit myself to Him because if not, I'm going to commit myself to me. I'm going to live in a way to justify myself and to please my flesh. Listen, personal, personal responsibility and practical calling. If today you're not a believer, you say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I've never been born again. Can I tell you this today? Jesus Christ does love you. Jesus Christ loves you so much that he went to Calvary. Uh, listen, don't, 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 don't get it misinterpreted. Uh, there's, there's real people that's going to die and go to a real place called hell because of the penalty of their sin. But there's also people that will go because they've been disobedient to the plan of God for salvation. God has a plan. His plan is Jesus Christ. There's no other plan. There's no other way. But God has presented it to you because He loves you and cares about you and wants to see you saved. So you have a choice. You can either be a believer or you can be disobedient to the plan of God. So if you're, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, I want to encourage you to be born again today before you leave. To let, to let Him redeem your soul. To buy it back and be reconciled to God. If you're here and you're a Christian, you've tasted, as the Bible said, that the Lord is gracious. So preacher, I know God's been good in my life. I know, that, I know that God has called me and made me anything that I am today. It's all because of God. I know that God was merciful in making me who was a nobody, a believer who at one time was a nobody. He's made me into the people of God. Listen, if that's the case this morning, then can I say as humbly as I can, act like you're somebody. Take it before a lost and a dying world. Take it before your lost family. Take it before your lost co-workers. Take it before those who are in the church, in the house of God, and act like you are somebody so that we can show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's stand this morning if you would.